Without question, one of the most criminally underrated artists out today, Argyle Goolsby. I've been a fan of his going way back to the early days of Blitzkid and then through everything he's done with Gorgeous Frankenstein, some other projects he wouldn't want me to mention, so I'm not going to. Um, but he has released what I consider to be his masterpiece record right here. This is Darken Your Doorstep. And I was able to catch up with Argyle backstage in Philadelphia on one of his recent shows. And I've been wanting to do an interview with him for a while. And at some point I'd love to put together a full Behind the Musician episode on him where we really dig into his entire career. And I'm hoping that's something that we're going to do. But for now, I wanted to get into talking about this record, get a little insight behind what made this record. And also for the fans too, bring up some of the early stuff with Blitzkid and just kind of get in Goolsby's mind a little bit. He's a criminally underrated musician and in the world of horror punk, one of the best, without question. I mean, for me, he's up there in the top three as far as, especially today. I mean, there's very few people doing it um, on that level and, and releasing absolute quality. And this record, I mean, the packaging, we if you look at the review that we did on this, the packaging, the material, the songs, everything about it just screams masterpiece to me. So hopefully you enjoy this conversation that we had with our guy Goolsby. Right here is a little prize um, for one of you lucky viewers out there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna put up a question uh, to all the fans of, of Goolsby. Gotta make sure you're a fan. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna in the comments below list your favorite Argyle Goolsby song and the reason why it's your favorite. What about it speaks to you? What about it makes it your absolute favorite song? It can be any song from his career going all the way back to the early days in Blitzkid or something off of this. I can't enter the contest so it, for me it would be Mr. Bob the Duke off of this record right here would be my favorite track. Um, what would be your favorite Argyle song? Mr. Bob the Duke. Yeah. Great but, track. Um, but what's let's your, go to you the can't enter either. So it's, I know. <laughs> so it's not for you. But what's your favorite track from Argyle Goolsby? Leave a comment below. Uh, let us know what your favorite is. And the reason why it's your favorite, we're going to pick one lucky winner at random to win this Nosferatu <laughs> pop right here, signed on the top by the man himself uh, for one of you lucky viewers out there that we're going to send it to you. So leave the comments and uh, check out this conversation with Argyle Goolsby. And uh, we'll see you. with the son of Nosferatu himself, Mr. Argyle Goolsby. Goolsby, thank you for taking a few minutes to talk to us. Thanks for talking to me. I, I want to go back, um, before we get into the new record, which is fantastic, I want to go back a ways and um, just get into the early days. What inspired you coming up? You know, What records inspired you? What made you want to go in this direction? Um, interestingly enough, um, not really a lot of horror punk bands. It was more bands like The Clash. Um, you know, the doors, bands like that, who were kind of like more moody and edgy, you know what I mean? Those were the bands I cut my teeth on. Um, I found out about the Misfits like, much later. Um, and then realized, like, you know, there was more of a niche, you know what I mean, into what I was doing, what I was interested in. So it kind of took that direction once I found out about the Misfits. Um, you know, prior to that, I was listening to bands like Screaming Jay Hawkins, you know, I mean, just a lot of weird kind of novelty 50s stuff, you know what I mean? So. Did you pick up influences? Because I mean, the part of the country that you're originally from mm -hmm. is like a, a, a hotbed of like urban legends and like, yeah. you know, did you kind of like pick up on those influences in your songwriting or? You Definitely, know? yeah. 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 I mean, uh, growing up, you know, I was surrounded by bluegrass and, you know, they have um, a, a, a section of bluegrass called murder ballads. You know, which are really just grisly kind of, you know, tales of, um, you know, murder and ghosts and things like that. Um, all rooted in some form of, um, you know, uh, fact or whatever you want to call it. So, uh, that was always an influence. Um, just the area that I'm from, too, is just very, you know, kind of somber. You know what I mean? Sure. 
American Gothic type style stuff. I mean, in Blitzkid, our uh, rehearsal space was directly across the street from an old coffin factory from the 1800s. Wow. So it was a town called Pocahontas. It's where TB lived. So it was crazy. I mean, we were around all that stuff all the time, you know. What was the formation of Blitzkid like? Did you start off saying, I want to be a vocalist? Mm-hmm. Or did you just go, I just want to be in a band, or I just want to play bass? Or how did you develop? It was, it was all by chance, man. Um, I had no... Uh, designs to be in a band at all you know I mean I was it, I was I started playing music when I started playing in Blitzkid so I was already like you know 19 years old you know what I mean I'd never I mean I fooled around on guitar a little bit but I never really had any experience with it um, I tried to play guitar when I was younger but I'm left-handed and um, you know naturally I wanted to play left-handed and everyone that could teach me at that time was right-handed and it was just too frustrating so I just gave up um, so I met, um, you know, TB, and he was in a band called Grape at the time. Grape? Grape, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, they were just kind of like a pop punk band, um, and I was helping out a lot with that band, just doing various roadie grunt work stuff, uh, you know, going to shows, loading in gear. Um, I did artwork for them, too. And that kind of fell apart, and that's when um, the idea of Blitzkid came about. And I was just actually going to just continue on with what I'd been doing in terms of artwork and, you know, helping out, you know, like in the labor department, I guess. But, uh, you know, he couldn't find a bass player and I was like, well, I'll just figure it out. And that's what happened, man. You know, I got a bass um, off a friend I borrowed and like three months later we had our first show and it just kind of went in that direction. And I, I wasn't singing at first, you know, I wasn't doing anything. I was just trying to... I wasn't even playing the right notes, you know. I was just trying to Did play. Did you have any formal training as a vocalist, uh, or you just? It was just necessity is the mother of invention, man. You know, it's that old saying. Got to the point where a lot of the clubs that we played in Blitzkid, I mean, no PA's, sure. uh, shitty PA's. What I've seen you, you several times in Blitzkid, and like it was. You, you know, saw me tonight. Was... I do this a lot, you know, just yeah. to hear myself. It happens, but you know. Prior to learning those tricks, you know what I mean. It was all about blowing your voice out and just sounding like crap. So that was what was happening to TB pretty r- routinely. Um, you know, I was writing music as well for the band. So it got to the point where he was like, dude, I can't maintain, you know, this, um, I guess, level of energy or whatever, this this, um, this key that we're in as long as I need to, you know. So, so I'll just sing my songs. And that's kind of what started it. You know, I just started singing to give him a break and then vice versa in time you know so we just kind of fell into the dual vocal position nothing in Blitzkid was planned not one shred of it down to the set lists I mean nothing we ever did was planned (laughs) which is weird that it it's always how it works out you know where did the The name come from uh the name okay so when the the project came up it was between three names it was going to be called all right A-OK an homage to Face to Face, which was one of our okay. favorite bands, or it was going to be um, Sad Sack. Yeah, I know, Sad right? Sack. I, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we we picked the better of the three. We did. Blitz Kid was um, that came later because that was the first horror punk song that the band wrote. Prior to that, you know, Grape was, as I said, kind of a, a pop punk band, and a lot of that kind of translated into Blitz Kid. Blitz Kid wasn't really any different than Grape at the beginning. Except we were experimenting with, you know, what would be horror punk songs. And that was Slaughter at the Sock Hop. And we had a song called Ad Nauseam Amore, uh, Teenage Necrophilia in Love. And then we had a song called Werewolf that we never, ever played um, or recorded. So those were the songs that kind of, you know, uh, made Blitzkid distinct from anything else that had happened. Um, and we just kind of rolled with it, you know what I mean? But the name Blitzkid itself came from uh, a line in one of the songs, Slaughtered the Sock Hop, uh, where it's like, nobody knew what happened at the high school dance that night when little Blitzkid snapped. It's kind of like a reference to Carrie. And we were like, you know, fresh out of being teenagers, you know, out of high school when those things still mattered. You know, like, oh, we got pushed around, picked on high school, it'd be cool, you know, we're like the Blitz kids, <laughs> and stuff like that. So, um, really... That name right there should tell you alone that we had no plan for this band. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, has absolutely nothing to do with our sound or anything. But I think it worked for us in the end. 
It did. You know I, what I mean? You guys, now Blitzkid kind of rose, you know, a lot higher. Than, and, and at the time, I know mm. that second wave of horror punk came in with, like, the Michael Graves era of Misfits. Right. And you guys kind of, like, went like this above a lot of other really good bands. But you guys, for some reason, you know, elevated above everybody else. What do you think it was about Blitzkid that took it to that that next level that, you know, pushed you guys forward? I don't know, man. I think that we just... We didn't really... We didn't try to compete. We didn't try to, you know, get involved in, you know, that aspect of what we were doing. You know, we just... We truly loved what we were doing, man. And I think when you have that, that's the only direction you can go. You know what I mean? When you're all on the same page and you're in concert with one another and you're, you know, fighting for the same cause. But we were just having fun. And, you know, like, each song that we wrote was just... We knew, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to make it sound prophetic or anything, but where we were from, we didn't have many options, man. It was either the coal mines... Or, you know, the military, you know what I'm saying? And I wasn't going to the coal mines, man. You know, like, my brother got killed in the coal mines. My dad almost died in the coal mines. I'm not going down that route, you know. So, like, we'd write this music that felt good, man, and it felt bigger than where we were. And I think that's the whole point, you know, in rock and roll and, and music and things like that, you know, is to transport you. So it was the next logical step to start taking it to other places, you know, like playing for people and... Um, different cities and just so happened that other people felt like we felt you know what I mean and I think that's what I don't know if it makes us distinct or not we just we didn't really we didn't place too much into it we, 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 we honored it and respected what we were doing but we didn't try to do it do you know what I mean sure it's that old saying you know and it's just kind of like like Bruce Lee like just be like water you know and that's kind of what we were and um but you guys were was, very you know, unique in that you you kind of crafted these little almost like King Diamond does for his genre of music where you like mm. crafted these little stories. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't your basic like okay Friday the 13th Jason's coming to kill you. It was like you no. guys tend to they were more intricate, more, you know, more well written. In the course of a three, you know, 3 minute yeah. song you told a story. Well, for me, you know, like I didn't I always loved, you know, horror punk you know, we didn't know it was called horror punk, man. When we, we called it ghoul rock when we started playing. That's what we called ourselves. Ghoul rock, man. Yeah, we told everybody we were from Ghoulie High. It was on the back of TV's <laughs> jacket said Ghoulie High. We all had it on our leather jackets at one point. Very Ramones-esque move on our part. But, um, you know, it was just us at the beginning. As far as we knew, and we didn't... you got to remember, this was 1997. I mean, the internet was virginal at best, man. There wasn't... Yeah. You couldn't just hop online and be like, oh, there's this band, this band, and this band. We just we just knew that we wanted to sound like face-to-face -face and bad religion meets the misfits meets the queers and screeching weasel, and we just worked with it from there. Um, but, yeah, it, it was just it was just strange how it worked out, man, as far as the material goes. Um, we didn't want to, like, write just songs that were literal, you know what I mean? Like, sure. we don't, I don't want to, like, just read the back of a VHS box and go, well, that's our song, you know? I was inspired by a lot of, like, um, old Hollywood producers and directors like, you know, James Whale, and uh, one in particular, a guy named Val Luton, who directed a lot of stuff for RKO um, back in, like, you know, 30s and 40s. He did, uh, like, The Cat People, I Walked with a Zombie, Curse oh, wow. of the Cat People, Bedlam, um, all those movies. But what was interesting about his movies were they never showed the horror they never showed anything like if you watch the cat people that you never see anything for example in that movie that would indicate that there's you know a cat person attacking anyone it was all kind of implied you know and I always liked that I always appreciated that you know the more mysterious aspects of things so you know I feel like every horror movie has that to a degree you just kind of got to break it down and find it and get down to it you know like you can take Friday the 13th and at the end of the day, you know, have a love story if you really want one, you sure, know? Sure. Just knowing how you kind of, like, approach it, man. And we kind of look more for the soul of, uh, you know, the, the horror and the aesthetic of it, you know what I mean? Yep. And put, like, some literary spin on, on it, no matter how cheesy it may have been subject-wise. So, I mean, whether it worked or not, I don't know, but, I mean, like, I'm pretty happy with the catalog and I still kind of write that way you know sure. I don't really write literally 
um, it's a lot of figurative kind of stuff, you know what I mean? So. Which of those records stands out to you the most as being the closest to you, or if you had to pick one that best represents mm. your time in Glitz Kid, what would you go with? My favorite would probably have to be Terrifying Tales, which I don't think that one represents our best work by any means. Um, but then again, I don't really judge our work like that. Do you know what I mean? Sure. I'm proud of everything we did, and everything that we put out was, um, you know, kind of like a representation of who we were and where we were at whatever time that album came out. Um, and lucky for us, I can look back on all of them and say, well, you know, these were all naturally, like, fluid albums. They weren't forced or anything, so I'm happy with all of them. But I think Terrifying Tales was just one of those albums for me where it was our... We had, we'd done our EP, which was called Revisited, and it was like four or five songs. And then Terrifying Tales was our first studio album. And I just remember like the excitement of it, you know what I mean? Recording it and that whole, the butterflies and the, um, you know, the newness of it, man. And just the electricity of it, man, being in the studio and just kind of knowing that's what I wanted to do no matter what. And so that one always takes me back to that frame of mind do you know what I mean sure. it's like a reset button sometimes to get back to that album does it amaze you now that all this time later there's still such like a like a blitz kid army of fans that yeah. are still loyal to you guys you know yeah it does man you know it's awesome though that's I couldn't ask for more you know um, I would have never guessed that anyone was ever going to listen to what we were doing you know I mean I know like I sound like I'm like playing humble but it's true I mean it really is man I we hadn't it was a shot an arrow into the air, man, you know, and just where it landed, we knew not where, you know, it was one of those deals, and it's, it, it kept going, and it went further than we anticipated, um, you know, and it, it, it struck a lot of chords, I guess, which is cool, you know, I mean, I, I feel really accomplished through what I did with that band, it's like, you know, it's kind of like, um, Catch-22, it's like a, like a, like a melancholy, because, you know, I'm not doing it anymore, you know, and I'm okay with that. It's, it, you know, because it was an entity. That band was more than just, you know, guitars and drums, and it, it, it had a life of its own, sure. you know, and it needed to do, it needed to breathe and live like we need to live and breathe. And, 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 and so while it bumps me out, I'm not doing it. Like, I'm, I'm cool with it, but it's just an irony, I guess, at the end is what I'm trying to say is how you know like it's not even happening but it's still effective you know and it still affects me too in a lot of ways you know that's all I ever wanted you know if we never play ever again man you know like as long as people remember then it's it's worthwhile now one of the biggest questions that you know I get asked from other fans of you guys especially mm. of you is the catalog the Blitz Kid catalog how difficult it is to get it's out of print right is there any chance at some point that the Blitz Kid catalog will be reissued, possibly, maybe. Uh, maybe, yeah. I mean, I'd like that. You know, it's it's just there's a lot of planning and something like that. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're not trying to like put everything in a vault like Prince or anything like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> R.I.P. But uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it'll be out. I mean, it was always hard to get our stuff because we. It goes back to what I was saying. We never looked at what we had as a product, man. Really. I mean, we were stupid, to be honest with you, you know what I mean? Like, I look back on it, and we would literally go on tour for months, man. And you probably saw us, because I know you used to come see us back in the day. We had nothing on the merch table. Yeah. People would be like, where's your merch? We're like, we don't have any. Like, how are you, what are you, what are you guys doing? We're like, just playing music, man. And, you know, I look back on it now, and I'm like, it probably would have availed us to have some CDs, which is why it's so impossible to find anything, man. Sure. When we did get things made, it was always on someone else's dime or like, you know, through a label or someone else's doing. So, you know, it, it wasn't really anything that we, uh, you know, managed on our own. You know, like Fiend Force did a lot of records for us, and then we were on this Antidote label, they put stuff out, and those are the things that people still find today, man. In I don't such have small all of our numbers. Stuff. Yeah, I don't. I don't even have our entire catalog. Really? Yeah, dude. I was on Facebook one day, like asking people to like send me a copy of Anatomy Reanimation. I was like, does anybody have the CD? I don't even have that one. I still don't. Wow. So yeah, it's just. I, weird, I think man. I got an extra. I'll send it to you. That's my favorite one. I, <laughs> Thanks, I love, man. I love the re-recordings of some of them songs. Just sound Thanks. phenomenal. So when Blitzkid, okay, Blitzkid, inevitably, you guys split. You know, whatever you want to 
call it. I yeah. don't know what you refer to it as, whether it's a, a breakup or whether it's just a it just dissolved end of man. the chapter. Yeah, you know what I mean. It, it comes to an end, like everything. You worked on other projects. You started to do some different things before you. I, I think before you started recording mm. uh, under your own name. Right. Was that just you kind of trying to find where you wanted to go next and yeah, just man. staying busy? or You know, like, I, I, I took a, a, a an intentional break from music after Blitz Kid. Not because I was having, like, a nervous breakdown or anything. It's just I was at a different station in life, man. You know, I was uh, beginning to tattoo again because I had finished my apprenticeship for tattooing in, in the year 2000. <laughs> like, it was a long time ago, man. And, and I was are you giving... an ordained minister? Yeah. Yeah, so there's that, too. So... <laughs> He can marry you. Yeah. So <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, I, I was I was doing that for a while. You know, um, you know, I my, I did my apprenticeship as I said, like back in two thousand. I began tattooing, and then the guys I was working with, they were like, "Listen, man, you know, you got to either be here all the time or not at all. So you got to choose what you want to do." And I, I chose the band, and um, you know, that's what I did, and until you know the band dissolved. And I was like, well, I need to do something else now. I mean, I, I'm not giving up on music. It's, you know, it's who I am. Uh, but I needed something that could, if I'm not on the road, living day to day and, and hand to mouth and, get, and staying alive, you know, that way, sure. I, I got to plan how I'm going to live now. So I went back into tattooing, um, but I started recording EPs, you know, just to have something to do and to put out. And that's how uh, A Dream Not Quite Remembered and Under the Witness Stars came out. And those eventually I put together... Uh, to be Saturnalia the Accursed once I got the design to do this as a full time band you know what I mean prior to that they were just kind of like music I was putting out just experimental stuff um, but yeah so I just took a little bit of a break there and um, you know had some speed bumps along the way we'll call it that <laughs> uh, I'm not going to get into all of that yeah. but uh yeah. Well, you did you did do some some projects, some yeah. not worth talking about, but then others that Definitely you know are, are pretty you know pretty cool too. The gorgeous Frankenstein thing was yeah, man, that was, was a was, cool project. I think I was I had a good time in that man. That was a trip, you know. Um, that that was fun. Um, I was in the band in the very experimental phases of it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You'll see pictures of me wearing a headset mic, man. You'll see me playing a prototype bass. So, you know, I was on the front lines for like five years in that band while it figured itself out. You know what I mean? Sure. So, you know, I didn't get all the glory or any of that, man, but I had fun. You know what I mean? Well, everything you did, including, I mean, you might not have got the glory from it, but I mean, you definitely gave it 110%. And, you know, I've, I saw you play with Gorgeous Frankenstein, I saw you in some of the other things that you did, too. It was always 110%. You could Thanks, always man. tell that, you know, you were passionate about it, performing. It takes you know. balls to get up there and play my play bass and try to sing Michael Graves' era songs at the same time, man. Sure. I, I was just with like, a headset, Kip Winger. It's uh, like, man, headset. yeah, dude. I was like, what am I doing up here? Like, what are we? What is this band? <laughs> but yeah, there was that. You know, that was fun. So, uh, so it brings us to Saturnalia, mm -hmm, yeah. and that's your first official release. You know, as Argyle Yeah. Midnight. Right. Technically, yeah. So, like, Argyle Goolsby and the Roving Midnight is, um, it's so complicated and I make it so confusing, but Argyle Goolsby is what I record under, and then the Roving Midnight is anytime I play with, like, an electric band, and then I have the Hollow Bodies, which is the full acoustic band. Okay. So, but yeah, that's the first Argyle Goolsby record um, that I knew what I was doing, okay. that I had a plan, you know? I just put that out because I got offered to go on a tour. Uh, in, in Europe with Nymph Van and Christian Death and I was like alright well I need to take something over there that's somewhat of a you know a, a calling card of what I'm doing so I put those together made that CD and then began work on Dark in Your Doorstep which came out last year now Dark in Your Doorstep for me I mean having followed you you know from the beginning all the way through the years and everything that you've recorded that record blows away anything it blew my mind it blew everybody's mind <laughs> Thanks, it's like man. it's so you set the bar so high for that thing and I mean I was kind of expecting because you've never put out shit never it's always Thanks. been quality stuff but that record once I put it on it was just like <laughs> dude like it's it's next level it's my stuff my heart and soul man I mean what what did it take for you to make that record where did the inspiration come from 
Is it, did you just feel like I need to make yeah, man. the best I, record? I, you know? Yeah, exactly, man. I mean, I don't. I feel that about everything I put out. You know, like I labor over everything, man. Like there's nothing that leaves my world and comes into yours with, that I haven't studied every angle of it. Like there comes a point where you can like kill stuff like that, you know, like by like just micromanaging everything you do and every aspect of it. Like there's a point you just have to step away. But in terms of like packaging and product and, and things like that, man, like it goes back to the aesthetic that I was talking about. I have like a real like I a real like conscious aesthetic to what I'm doing, at least how I feel, you know, it looks or should look or should feel. So, you know, I make sure that everything I do, including like the music I write and down to the packaging represents that. And that's why it took so long for Dark in Your Doorstep. Um, you know, I just wanted it to be exactly what it needed to be. There were a lot of times where it could have come out earlier, but like I would have been cutting corners, you know sure. what I mean, to put it out. Um, and then probably corners that wouldn't have even mattered or even been noticed, you know, having been cut. But um, the inspiration behind it was just, you know, moving forward. I, As I said, Saturnalia was the only thing I had. And while it's, I'm proud of every song on that album, it wasn't really indicative of what I knew that I was moving into, you know? So I really wanted to take a record that I knew would be the definitive uh, stamp for what Argyle Goolsby is, or, you know, what's going to come from this, you know? And you that's, that. that's what the album was, was a big stamp on everything. Like, this is what it is, this is my brand. My favorite vocal that you've ever put down to tape, out of everything that I've ever heard you do, is Save Me Tonight from the Horror Hound uh, yeah. movie soundtrack. What made you decide to cover that song? I didn't, man. They gave me that song. Uh, really? Yeah. I At first I got um, uh, Lost in the Shadows by Lost Boys, right? Yeah. And I just could, it was just really weird, man. It was, I love the song. I love the movie, but that song is an E chord for straight up like eight minutes, man. And I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> And so I was like, can I get a different song? And they were like, yeah, here's this one. And I heard it, and I was like, man, what am I going to do with this? And um, I kind of stressed over it for a little bit, man, just because, you know, it's not really, uh, you know, my speed in terms of, like, what I'm used to performing or writing. And then I just kind of got in the studio, and it wasn't until I was in the studio that it came together. Um, and then once it came together, it really came together. And, like... Once I saw like the light, you know what I mean, with sure. the song, I just followed it, and um, I'm really happy with it, man. Like, I'm glad I got that song, you know what I mean, because oh it, it was a challenge, man. It really was, and I don't think that I would have ever, you know, um, put myself in that position had it not been presented to me. Do you know what I mean? So it, I, I love that song, man, and we play it as often as possible live. Do you keep an archive? of your stuff because you're you're kind of like in an interesting position where you're you're heavily collected there's people yeah. that you know collect Argyle Goolsby memorabilia I mean, whether it's Blitzkid stuff right. solo stuff I mean is it do you personally keep an archive of that stuff I, I do now yeah just because um, yeah, all the Blitzkid stuff as I said man I never really kept too much track of it we were talking earlier like when we like vinyls are kind of commonplace now you yeah. know for bands but we came back, back then you guys were, we had vinyls in 2003 yeah, and people crazy. were like I don't want this we were trying to give them away because we didn't have room oh. for them we were like just please take this Trace of a Stranger vinyl and they're like what are they I'm like just fucking throw them they're frisbees I don't know <laughs> do something with it and wow. and now you know like that's that's a thing so I see those things on eBay now for like ridiculous prices yeah. um, so I just and that's not why I keep everything it's just um, you know it, I don't know I'm proud of what I do, man. You know what I mean? Like, there's a difference in being proud and being prideful. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, I'm proud of what I do because I put a lot of work into it. And it's like an extension of my self. So, yeah, I do, I do keep kind of like at least one of or two of everything I do now. Is there, uh, do you still find the same influences as the, as the 19 year old Argyle Goolsby coming up? Do you still mm. draw from the same place? Do you still yeah. have the same influences? I do, man. I really do. Like, I mean, obviously they've expanded into, you know, other things, but like, I've not lost touch. You know, I'm not in that weird, shadowy world where I look back on, you know, 19 years old and try to remember what it felt like to, you know, 
you know, be inspired by the things that I was inspired by. Like, you know, I've definitely been fortunate for that. You know, I, I, I've always had a really, um, I guess, strong sense of what I like, if you know what I mean, and, and, and who I am and where I want to go and never really, like, detracted from that. I've always allowed myself to like take new experiences. So, um, I'm, I'm in a happy place, man. You know, as far as that goes, you know. Yeah, I don't want to make you try to pick a favorite track from yeah. on your doorstep simply because yeah. <laughs> the whole record, start to finish, it's to me, it's like one thing, body of work that needs to be heard Thank and you. enjoyed together. There's not a weak song on the thing, and if there was, I would say it because yeah. I have no problem saying that. But yeah, no, I, it is from start to finish. Thank you. A, a masterpiece record and I said it when I reviewed it before it's just like that thing is you set the bar so high so Thanks, what's man. what's next for you or are you just right now enjoying the success of you know the reactions from Dark New um, Step and yeah yeah I definitely am um, but like there were songs that didn't make Dark New Doorstep that I just wanted to work on more you know so I, I, I came into that this record this release with songs that I was happy with but just needed more time and I've definitely wrote more over the summer and there are some that I have <clears throat> ideas for that I want to start writing now so my plan is to just take all those things and start working on them and uh, I, I plan on getting back in the studio you know this year this coming up year 2018 so um, you know expect another full length as soon as I kind of figure out exactly I, yeah, I just don't throw songs on albums you know, just because sure. I got them. I know a lot of bands are like, "Oh, I got a hundred records out. I've wrote three hundred songs." <laughs> like, yeah, and you got five good ones. Like, yeah. you know, like I take my time, man, and put together what I can. You know, make an experience out of it. Kind of how dark your doorstep was. Like, I'm glad that you said that about it because that's what I'm hoping for, man. I don't want it to be just a record. I want it to be like from start to finish, like a, a, a place and a thing. You know, like its own deal. And um, I think that. I'm on the track, you know, that I need to be on with this next album. I just don't know what the mood of it is yet, you know? I need to sit down and look at everything, see sure. what the, the vibes are, and then just develop off of that, you know? And then just see where it takes me. And I love the different, you know, different vinyl pressings of Dark in Your Doorstep. Was that there's something a you, lot, you, man. There is. There's like five or six. I think there's... Which, right? Well, there's... There's the three originals. Yeah. There's the three, <laughs> and then there's uh, the second pressing. And then, <laughs> excuse me, um, there's the Ring of Fire, the European edition that came out. And um, I also have another version I want to do. I, can't, I don't want to give too much away with it yet, but it's pretty cool. Another vinyl version? Yeah, of Dark Your Doorstep. But, um, you know. Great, so I'll have six copies, and you should too. Yeah, you know. I mean, but that's the thing, man. Like, the, I didn't, again, I didn't cut any corners, man. They're beautiful the vinyls, man. It's unbelievable, dude. It's Thank unbelievable. You. I mean, I, with, you know, I made a 10 by 10 booklet, 20 pages. We talked about uh, that. It was like, it reminded me stuff, of like a man. Kiss packaging almost. Yeah, like man. an old, you know, Kiss Alive 2 almost with the booklet and the, and the, the color of the vinyl and just the whole I, entire thing. I just want to give people the same stuff that like, I want to see and at the same time, man, raise the bar. Because I'm not shitting on horror punk, man, but like it gets shit on all the time. And I understand why, man. You know, a lot of people are content with just kind of, uh, you know, giving it 60%. It's the type of genre, man, where I'll never forget, man. Um, the Dave Ellison came to see us one time, right? And he's like, listen, he's like, you guys do the type of music that could be done um, very badly, very easily. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, but you guys do it great. So I'm like, all right. You know, that's the truth, man. You know, so I just try to do what I can, like videos and albums and everything, to like raise the bar, man. I'm not trying to be better than anyone else. I just really like what I do, you know. And it does get shit on quite a bit, man. You know, it's hard to really establish yourself as a horror punk artist. It's a very eye rolling, you know, title to give yourself to a lot of people. Um, so you're you're out there waving the flag for horror punk. You still consider man, yourself the horror sure, punk? Sure, dude. Yeah, I mean, I don't limit myself to that, but like that is definitely a flag that I will go into battle carrying. You know, I'm and the led... videos, the videos that you're presenting too are like mini movies. You know, they're yeah, they're man. incredible. I, Thank I you. highly recommend go checking them out. The yeah. Mr. Babadook video. We, was, I was floored. <laughs> I seen it. I'm like, this thing's like a, a film. You know, it's yeah, like yeah, man. It's we had a whole set in there. I mean, it was like. It was a full-on production, you know. 
like in Vote of Light, we were trying to do like an old Hammer style, you know, film. And then uh, I just got back from Salt Lake City, which is where we filmed the other, those two. That's where the crew I work with uh, are located. And we're doing another video. So there'll be another one out in February, full on production. I don't want to give away to see how which one it is because sure. we're trying to like build up some PR sure. for it. But yeah. Well, as long as we know it's coming. It's definitely coming, man. For All sure. Right. Well, very cool. Yeah, Argyle, man. thank you so much. Thank you very much. I man. highly, I, to everybody out there, seriously, and as much as I know Blitz Kid means a lot, means a lot to me, it means a lot to, you know, yeah. to the fans and stuff. What he's doing now is absolutely on, on at the very minimum on the level, if not surpassed, in my personal opinion, as a Thanks, fan. Man. So go check it out. Definitely pick up Dark in Your Doorstep. Hit up Argyle Goolsby's website. He's got amazing merch. He got a book. I, I literally just seen it as I was walking in here. I'm like, where did that oh, come you from? Seen it yet? I yeah. didn't see it. I didn't even see it on the table. It was so a lyric book. Definitely go so. check out Argyle Goolsby's stuff. Catch him when he's in your town. And to one lucky fan out there, one lucky winner is going to get... Nosferatu and I'm going to have Goofy yeah. sign it for you Absolutely. so one of you guys is going to win this thing and uh that's right you know <laughs> we we had this exact same guy sitting on uh the console of the uh engineer desk when we were recording uh Dark in Your Doorstep not this guy not this particular one but the spirit of this one so Nice. Yeah, there it is. Perfect. So, so there you go. One of you guys is going to get this. Awesome. Again, Goolsby, thank you so much. Thank you very much, man. It's a pleasure. Yeah.